All right, all the poor souls who didn't make it into Judge Napolitano's course are here to hear me. That's fine. That's just fine. Okay. I uh, had a little issue. We had some problems with printer connectivity, and so there's a page that, with a quotation that I want to read to you that didn't quite get printed out, but it is on my phone, which is charging now, so it'll be just about ready. This phone takes five years to charge. It'll be just about ready for me to have 10 seconds to read you that quotation at the very end. All right, I'm going to use this... Uh, this thing, to write down the names of some people I bet a lot of you will never have heard of. Because they've done, they've done really good work on the kinds of topics I'm going to raise today, but they're not, they're not Austrians. And it's easy for us to overlook them, but they've done really good stuff. And, and if you're interested in some of the topics that I'm, I'm interested in, you'll find this valuable. There's something a little odd about the title of this session. It's just one word. Now, that could, I could talk about anything with that one word. The reason it's just one word is the people who put this program together wrote to me and said, we'd like you to do the opening talk, and we'd like you to do the Contra Krugman thing, and the panels, and the office hours, and everything, and then we'd like you to do a talk on some aspect of war. So just get back to us with your title for that talk. I never did. I just blew them off. I just... <laughs> Because we, we were moving, and I, I frankly, I just couldn't, I couldn't keep up with everything. So they, they showed me. They just titled it War, and they left it at that. So that's why it's so broad. What I thought I would do, given how broad the topic is, is not talk about, you know, obviously the moral aspects of war that I might normally talk about, or libertarian ethics and war that I might also normally talk about. I should confine myself to, to uh, arguments that have something to do with economics, given the nature of this week. So I want to raise a series of points that have to do with war from an economic point of view. And th these are points that are often missed in assessing the costs of war. So I want to make sure that when we think about war, we are taking into account the full cost involved. Toward the end, I will say a little bit also about the old war makes us richer argument. I mean, I'm, I suppose a lot of people are tired of hearing that one answered. I have a whole pay, resource page that answers that, but I'll say, I'll take a few minutes. I've, I've written a little bit about that myself, but I'll refer you to the best material on that subject. But boy, that just never goes away. I honestly thought that after Robert Higgs smashed that definitively in the literature, I, I was naive enough when I was younger to think, because he started writing on that subject in the early 90s, I was naive enough around age 20 to think, oh, that's good. No one will ever raise that dumb argument again, that war, <laughs> war makes us prosperous. I really thought that was dead and buried. And uh, Bob Higgs years later told me, no, to, Tom, that just ain't how it works. It just is not how it works. Okay. The first point I want to raise involves the idea of costs of war in terms of opportunity costs. And in particular, I want to talk about the preparation for war, the military state. And let's, let's take a country more or less at random, the United States. Let's, let's pick that <laughs> and talk about the costs involved in having a state that is so devoted to military action and an, basically developing an ideology around the military and in, in, in effect, almost defining the culture by the military. I mean, you see in football games, whether college or professional, or in, I mean, just in every aspect of culture, you land on an airplane, and there's somebody from the military on the plane, and everybody applauds. It's, it's, you know, or you go to get ice cream, and if you're in the military, you get 10% off. It's everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. What are the costs related to, to this type of investment? So the first person I want to introduce you to, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to. And that is the old Seymour Melman. All right. Now this, I'm just going to ask you to be honest, okay? I want just one moment of honesty. The rest of the week, you can, you can bluster about your knowledge. But right now, I just want honesty. Other than the faculty, is there anybody who's ever heard of this guy? Awesome. All right, good. I mean, it's awesome that you have, and it's awesome that no one else has, because otherwise I really have nothing else to say. So, 
that's good. All right, Seymour Melman, who died in, 19, in, I beg your pardon, 2004, was a professor at Columbia University. He was a professor of industrial engineering and operations research, and I don't even know what that is. But he focused a lot of his professional work on looking at the way the Pentagon distorts the U.S. economy. But he came at this really as a, as a leftist. There's no question he's on the left. But you can see that uh, Rothbard seems to have been rather fond of him. He thought that he had certainly some insights. And what's nice about the Mises Institute, by the way, one of the many things, is that the shelves, just as you walk in, there are particular shelves that are marked as being the Rothbard collection. This means they were the actual volumes Rothbard himself owned. So for many of these, you can pick the book up, flip through, and read Rothbard's marginalia. Well, good luck, because his, his writing is absolutely indecipherable. But, he, but he'll, it'll be indecipherable, 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 exclamation mark four times. I wish I knew what he was so excited about. But with Melman, he'll, you know, he'll underline the points that he likes, and then occasionally Melman will say something, not being an economist, Melman will make an error. Rothbard has a big old X through it. Like, this one's wrong. So it helped me with my reading. Okay, yeah, I guess Melman's wrong here. But what's interesting about Melman is that he really did appreciate the idea of opportunity cost and the Bastiat insight, you know, what is seen and what is not seen. And in fact, I ended up writing a paper about Seymour Melman, and I sent it out to a couple of his uh, colleagues who were on the left. They had never heard of Bastiat, but they loved the what is seen and what is not seen insight and essay, and they thought it was great that a libertarian was talking about Melman and that he, that he wasn't forgotten. So before I get into any details about, about him, I would just refer you In the, journal, in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, you can Google this, or it would be at the Mises website. I have an article, um, and I, I don't remember the immediate title, but the subtitle is An Austrian Tribute to Seymour Melman. So if you just type in Woods, Seymour Melman, how many links could possibly come up? That must be it. So I would urge you to check that out. Here's a, here's a statement that Melman made, and give you a sense of the kinds of insights we're talking about, and how interesting it is that he, he did come from the left. He says, Industrial productivity, the foundation of every nation's economic growth, is eroded by the relentlessly predatory effects of the military economy. Traditional economic competence of every sort is being eroded by the state capitalist directorate that elevates inefficiency into a national purpose, that disables the market system, that destroys the value of the currency, and that diminishes the decision power of all institutions other than its own. Well, I can make common cause with someone like that. So Melman believed that there, there were effects that the Pentagon had on the economy. They, they were many. But these were effects that were negative in terms of the American standard of living. So Melman was at pains, for example, to point out that when you're looking at GDP figures, you are not necessarily getting a good picture of the overall health of the economy. Again, very good. That's a very good insight because he says that GDP is, of course, a quantitative measure. It's a number, but it's not a qualitative measure. So if the government blows a whole lot of money on nothingness, on handing out spoons to people so they can dig holes with it, that gets added. That's a number. It gets added to the number. But we know that qualitatively, that is not a helpful amount of output for the government to produce a lot of spoons or buy a lot of spoons. This is not helpful for us. It doesn't contribute to our welfare. But GDP is just a dumb number. It's just a dumb number. It can't tell you that. So Melman wanted to distinguish between what he called productive growth, or he might have said productive spending, and parasitic growth. So productive growth would be growth that actually, con so the growth of, of productive spending is spending that contributes to our well-being, to the well-being of consumers, or to the future well-being of consumers by investing in capital goods today. We can have a greater abundance of consumer goods and better quality consumer goods in the future. That's productive growth. So again, what possible objection could we have to that way of thinking? Likewise, he says, we need to think about the idea of parasitic growth when we look at the military state, because this is merely expenditure of resources that just depletes manpower, 
or it depletes existing stocks of goods, but does not contribute to our welfare, either in the present or in the future. Now, you may say, by the way, that hold on, Woods, in, to some degree, like even, even in a stateless society, we would devote some resources to some kind of military equipment. And, and that's certainly true. There's no doubt about it. To some degree, you would have to defend yourself. But in a way, even though he's by no means an anarchist, Melman has anticipated that objection as well because he introduces the concept of overkill. Yes, we would probably need to defend ourselves against bad people. But he had this profound insight that you cannot destroy a city more than once. Once it's destroyed, that's it. It was destroyed. Now, maybe they'll rebuild it in 20 years and you might destroy it again. But in the immediate term, once it's destroyed, it's destroyed. So the excess, the ability to destroy a city 500 times, well, 499 of those at least would be what he would call overkill. And that would be parasitic. That would be parasitic spending. So let's consider. By the 1960s, the United States government, just looking at its strategic aircraft and missiles, could unleash in explosive power the equivalent for every person on Earth of six tons of TNT for every single human being in the world. The U.S. government could unleash six tons of TNT worth of explosive power. So what Melman would ask was, are you telling me that I'm safer now that we can detonate six tons of TNT for each person than I would be if we had, I don't know, only four tons of TNT per person? Wouldn't we still be sort of okay with just the four tons? Or even one ton? How about if we really tighten our belts? Just a ton of TNT per person. <laughs> Wouldn't the five extra be parasitic? This is clearly wasteful. So what he's trying to do I mean, and I love, the, I love the fact that he uses the word parasitic. That's a very Rothbardian term. All right. So again, he says GDP can't distinguish between these sorts of things. It can't, can't make a determination of overkill, obviously, and it can't deter, make distinguish between what's productive and what's parasitic. All right. So now let's look at some specific examples to help understand uh, what, we're, what we're dealing with when we look at the, the military state. And we're looking at costs here. We're looking at opportunity costs. Every single tank, or as, as Melman would say, every excess tank, every tank that's obviously over the top unnecessary, comes at the expense of something else. And that is at the root of all economics, not just Austrian, but all economics, is cost. And of course, you see it at the very beginning of, of the praxeological chain of reasoning that human beings act and they're using scarce means to achieve their ends and I am limited in, in the ends I can achieve because I have the, there's a finitude here, I have only one body, I have limited resources, so I implicitly rank my ends and when I achieve one end, it's very nice, but my achievement of that end comes at the expense of the second most valued end that I might have otherwise achieved. There's always, there's, so there's cost at the very heart of the Austrian analysis, that when I pursue end A, it's at the expense of end B. So cost is right there at the very beginning of that praxeological chain. And the costs are really quite stunning. So for example, if you want to train a single combat pilot, you're looking at an expenditure between five and seven million dollars, one combat pilot. Or think about this. Think of all the fuel you consume as a motorist over the course of two years. It's a lot of fuel. That's about how, uh, how much fuel a single F-16 training jet consumes in under an hour. So it's helpful to think about these comparisons. Or how about one of my favorite examples, the old Abrams tank. Now, you know how you sometimes you, you talk about miles per gallon? A car gets X miles per gallon. Maybe a hybrid car, you know, gets 48, 50 miles a gallon. I don't know. I don't have one of those sort of cars, but maybe, you know, but maybe that is what the mileage is. Maybe it's something like that. The Abrams tank, you can't even do miles to the gallon. It's, it's gallons to the mile. 
It's 3.8 gallons to the one mile. Or how about this? Between 2 and 11% of the world's use of 14 important minerals, all the way from copper to aluminum to zinc, is consumed by the military. And indeed, 6% of the world's petroleum consumption is consumed uh, by the military. The Pentagon's energy use in one year could power all U.S. mass transit systems for nearly 14 years. Hmm. Here's some more outreach to your left-wing friends, right? That's why I'm here, to build bridges. That's why I'm here. Okay. How about this for thinking in terms of opportunity costs? Between 1947 and 1987, the Department of Defense used $7.62 trillion in capital resources. In 1985, the U.S. Department of Commerce estimated the value of the nation's capital stock at just over $7.29 trillion. So that means that with that expenditure of resources by the Department of Defense, you could have either completely replaced the U.S. Uh, capital stock, uh, or at the very least modernized it in some way. So it's a, very, it's a staggering investment of resources that we're talking about. And if anything, that's an understatement, because any portion of that money that had gone to the Pentagon that, was, that instead we might have diverted to civilian use, that civilian use in, in, in capital expenditure would have gone to the purchase of capital goods that yield you an ever-increasing output over time. It, it would have increased the country's productive capacity, which means greater production in perpetuity. But we didn't have that because of all the, at the very least, we can say the parasitic growth or spending. So this gives us something of a taste of the costs that we're talking about. They're not trivial, in other words. All right, let's consider another cost of the military state. Think of geniuses. Now, it's, it's, there's a finite number of geniuses. So it's not the case that if 10% of the geniuses get siphoned off into some project, that somehow replacement geniuses will sprout up. It's, this is a zero-sum game. Geniuses doing Project A are not available to undertake Project B. Well, it so happens that since World War II, somewhere between one-third and two-third of all technical researchers in the United States have been working for the military at any given time. So think in terms of the costs involved there, the opportunity costs involved there. The opportunity cost there is civilian research that isn't being done because those people have all been sucked into the, you know, military industrial complex. And here's what Melman said. Again, this is a guy on the left. When research and development is not properly done on behalf of civilian industry, results like poor product design or poor production methods can have disastrous effects on the economic position of the industry. When as little as 1.5% of U.S. national product is diverted to military research, it seems little enough. But that accounts for more than half of the national research and development effort and has left many U.S. civilian products industries at a competitive disadvantage due to faltering product designs and insufficient improvement in industrial production efficiency. Now that is a very interesting insight that it's very, very easy to overlook, and I know that because I overlooked it for years. It never occurred to me that's yet another cost that we have to bear. Now, of course, government was able to siphon off these brilliant minds and these talented people because it could offer them tax-funded salaries that the private sector at that time could not keep up with. In fact, the Wall Street Journal in the early 1960s reported that people in industry 
had begun to argue as follows. Frantic bidding by space and military contractors for scientists and engineers is creating a big shortage for industry. This scarcity, along with the skyrocketing salaries it is provoking, is bringing almost to a halt the hitherto rapid growth of company-supported research. This development hampers efforts to develop new products and processes for the civilian economy. Now, you may say, well, that's the Wall Street Journal. Of course they're going to say that. Of course they're going to defend the, you know, private business or whatever. But the American Economic Review, which I'm sorry to say does not always seem to defend uh, the private sector, said this, did a study, there was a study published in the American Economic Review saying that the growth of military and space research and development, and now I'm quoting, has significantly retarded the growth of civilian research and development. So the, this is research development that was never done. And, and, and that's, that opportunity is gone forever. And then continuing from the, the study, the growth of research, uh, I beg your pardon, the growth of defense R&D, R&D research and development, of course, by bidding up salaries and taking the cream of the new science and engineering graduates has tended to reduce significantly the quantity and quality of R&D undertaken in civilian created laboratories. Now, there is some argument to the effect that, after all, I ought not to be complaining to this, this degree because there is what some specialists call crossover. That is to say, I mean, you've heard this a lot, that, well, you wouldn't have GPS technology if it weren't for the government blowing all this money on the military all these years. You know, so that's called crossover technology, where government is doing research to figure out how to, you know, develop new weapon systems, and in the course of doing that, it invents Tang or whatever it comes up with. It, 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 it invents all these other things, and these things turn out to have civilian uses, so it's not all a waste. And I've written a little bit about, I believe there is a section in that JLS article that I refer you to, where I go through and look at, at some of that, because there are a variety of estimates as to, to what extent the Pentagon spending over the years has redounded to the benefit of the public indirectly. And again, it, it reminds me of what I've said about Norway. A lot of times you'll hear in, about the Scandinavian countries, that, well, the Scandinavian governments you, give you a lot of great things if you live in those countries. You get free education, for example, you know, free university education. And so I've, on my podcast, I've had people from, from Sweden and Norway and Denmark come on and talk about those countries. And I had a person from Norway come on and say, Basically, the tax rate you're faced with in Norway is 70%. So my response to this has been, well, if I were paying 70% in taxes, I would expect to get something. Of course I would expect to get free education. Something better come to me from 70% tax rate. Well, likewise, after all this military spending, if a few inventions come out of it, well, that's the least I could expect. But the Melman was of the belief that the lower end estimate, maybe 5%, you know, it's anywhere between 5 and 33% of, of these, uh, some of these technologies really are due to, to defense research. He said it was, very, it was very, very low and extremely inefficient. And by and large, these are things, as a lot of other scholars have said, that were going to be invented anyway. You know, when you look at some of the things they claim credit for, they were probably going to be, it was impossible to imagine them not being invented. But they would have been, in, they would have been developed according to society's timetable. Yes, it's true. We could maybe have invented the iPod in the year 1900 if we had used all the resources of society, all the brain power, and siphoned it off to inventing an iPod, and we had taken all the resources that we might have used to build infrastructure and capital goods, and we'd sucked them all away yeah, and we would all be dirt poor. Nobody could buy one of these things. We would want to kill anybody who mentioned an iPod. It wouldn't have been the right time. I mean, yeah, there are always a million things to, that you could possibly think of. You know, I mean, it's easy to, 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 to take reservations at the car place. Anyone can take them. The thing is holding the car. Well, likewise, it's easy to, come up, to dream up all different products. That's the easy part. But the, the question is, 
on what timetable do we develop them? To what extent do we deprive ourselves of other goods while we're siphoning resources into research and development? Well, that's what the market is for. It rations these projects in a way that is consistent with consumer preferences. But there's a lot more that can be said about that crossover thing. Peter Klein has written about it. And as I said, I have a little bit in that article that, that deals with it. But that's their attempt to try to desperately claim that these, tr these trillions of dollars haven't, haven't really been a waste. The other effect, another effect of Pentagon dominance over some firms is that as a firm gets more and more involved in contracting with the Pentagon, and as the Pentagon becomes, let's say, the chief buyer of its products, the firm's business sense begins to dissipate. Because the Pentagon, as you may have heard, does not make cost consciousness its top priority. So if you're a business firm catering to the Pentagon, you don't have to worry about controlling costs as much as you would with any other client. Because the Pentagon will come, I mean, yeah, obviously there is some limit, but by and large, the Pentagon will come up with the money one way or another. What it really wants to know is, can you deliver on time? Can you deal with the fact that they're going to be making a whole lot of changes and demands as you're working on the project? And can you roll with the punches? They're suddenly going to make you pivot and change it a little bit. Can you deal with that? Can you speak the language of the military community? These are the, our higher priorities. And so what firms become, as Melman said, are not profit-maximizing, cost-minimizing firms, but rather cost-maximizing and subsidy-maximizing firms. I said, one way or another, the money will, will be produced. Let's take an example. Starting in the 1960s, the Pentagon began to use something called historical costing. It would use past prices of, you know, let's say they're developing a new warplane. They'd look at an older warplane, and they'd use that as a baseline to estimate future costs. Well, if this one costs so-and-so, we'll take that cost, and maybe we'll add in 10% or something, and that's what we want to shoot for in our cost estimate for the next plane project. Now, that seems sensible. I mean, you know, if you, if you have that type of system, if you have a Pentagon, you have tax funds, you know, that seems like a sensible way of trying to estimate costs as any other. The problem with it is it bakes into that particular cake. Pardon me, Gary Johnson. It, it, oh, that was a low, low. I wasn't, wasn't expecting to make that, make a cake joke, but it, it bakes into there the, a bias toward ever higher prices. Because if you're going to say, well, this is the baseline, then firms, you know, there's no scrutinizing of those past prices. There's no scrutinizing of the, the costs that were incurred to yield you a project that costs that much. You just say, well, that's our baseline. So we start from there. So instead of thinking, well, let's, let's try and cut costs, cut costs, cut costs. Well, why bother? Because th the baseline's here. Why say, well, but if we cut, we could get below the base. You don't have to because of historical costing. And also, if a plane or whatever it is winds up, winds up at the end of the project costing way, way more than the estimate, then that way, way more than the estimate cost becomes the baseline for the next plane project. So there's this upward ratcheting of, of, uh, of cost. There's a good specific example of how being so enthralled of the Pentagon, having the Pentagon be your chief, uh, again, customer, there's a good example of that, and that's the American mach machine tool industry. And here I want to refer you to another person. Anthony DiFilippo. Anthony DiFilippo was a, uh, basically a student of Seymour Melman. And he, he wrote a book on, um, now I, again, I had this in my, we had trouble finding printers that would connect to, oh, here it is, yeah, I did put this in the later version. He wrote a book called Military Spending and Industrial Decline. Now, I remember the title, but I don't remember the subtitle, A Study of the American Machine Tool Industry. And what he did was he showed what happened to the American machine tool industry, and he pointed the finger for what happened to it at the Pentagon. Well, what, what did happen to it? The American machine tool industry had been uh, a real success story in the American economy. And it, it was highly competitive all over the world, was very cost conscious. And then in the 1970s, after by the 60s, again, the Pentagon had become one of its biggest customers. 
it was overtaken by Japan and Germany. It became not cost conscious. And, and a good example of this is eventually there developed a kind of machine tool technology called numerical control machine tool technology. And this was the technology of the future. And the Japanese were developing it and the Germans were developing it. And they developed it in such a way that it was conceivable that the private sector in those countries could use it because it was not very costly. But then when you turn to the American case, and Filippo goes into detail about this, the American firms were so used to catering to the Pentagon that, yeah, they developed numerical control machine tool technology, but it was so hopelessly expensive that nobody in the private sector could conceivably even imagine using it. And he says that the, the whole structure of the American machine tool industry became deformed and relentlessly uncompetitive. Uh, as a result of its experience catering to the Pentagon. The private sector could not afford what it was putting out. All right, another person I want you to know about is a, I wish I had a, a lav mic here, but that's okay. He's, he's, he was a uh, Pentagon analyst. Named Chuck Spinney. And he, he was around a long time. And in fact, his, his friend, we'll put this guy down. Um, you should also know about his friend Winslow Wheeler, who retired a couple years ago. Uh, Wheeler was on the Hill for decades. Um, I, I wonder, actually, I'm kind of wondering if, um, if Shauna, did you ever know Winslow Wheeler? Uh, yeah, did you? He was a Republican who um, wanted to cut the defense budget. So I thought he might stick out like a sore thumb in Washington, D.C. All right, well... Okay, because because we we I used to have I had him on my show once. Scott Horton used to have him on all the time, uh, because he was a Republican, and he thought that Pentagon spending was totally out of control. Well, anyway, Wheeler's the only one of these people that I know for sure was right of center. Well, this guy was not on the left, but but in terms of these other people, he this guy I know was at least nominally a Republican. Uh, Chuck Spinney more or less developed these two ways of thinking of what the Pentagon is up to. And the first one, you may have heard me talk about this before, the first one is the term front-loading, and the second one is the term political engineering. It was really Chuck Spinney who came up with these ideas, who gave the name to these ideas, these phenomena that he was observing. Front-loading would be when you, you take some military project and you vastly overpromise what it will deliver all the things it'll be able to do, and it's going to be just like a whiz kid project, and you won't be able to believe how amazing it'll be. You oversell it. And you likewise understate the cost, because that's another way of overselling something. It's going to be cheap, you say. Now, eventually, you think, that strategy can't work forever, because eventually people will realize the project stinks, it doesn't do what they said it would do, and it costs 10 times more than they promised. So you think, well, that, project, that, that strategy can't go on forever. That's where political engineering comes in. Political engineering is the process whereby you take these projects and you spread the project out all over the country. You spread the jobs and the profits particularly in districts that have committee chairmen as the congressman, so that that project will never be discontinued. Or it'll be really hard because there'll be a lot of vested interests who want to keep it going. So even when people realize that it was overpromised and they realize that it's over budget, you can't stop it. Once you turn on that taxpayer spigot, you can't turn it off again. So it's, the, it's that dual strategy of front-loading and political engineering that led to all these problems. Problems that every dozen years or so would yield you, maybe every 15 years, would yield calls for a blue ribbon commission to investigate the ongoing cost explosions in the military, the military industry. And every, you know, 1955, 1970, over and over and over, they have the Blue Ribbon Commissions. And they point out exactly what's wrong. Some of these Blue Ribbon Commissions were fine. They, they did point out what was wrong, and then nothing happened. It just kept on going, kept on going. So spin, the, the F-22 and the F-35, if you're interested in researching examples of this, I would start there. Look those up. Okay. Let's move into 
does war make us richer? I know you know it doesn't, but I also know you have friends who thinks who think it does. So let's address that at least briefly. Firstly, I want to refer you to the path-breaking article on this. It's not like no one ever realized before that war doesn't make you richer, but the, the one that really, that actually did make some people sit up and take notice was an article in the Journal of Economic History, I think in 1992, and it's by a guy you ha I, I think many of you will have heard of. Of course, of course. What's the last name? Right, right. I don't have room to, or the time to write out the name of the article. The name of the article is, all you need to know is the, the, the main title, Wartime Prosperity, question mark. Wartime Prosperity? And then the subtitle is Reassess uh, a reassessment of the U.S. economy in the 1940s. So that's published in the Journal of Economic History. It's a big-time journal. That matters. And he later took this material and expanded on it, added other articles, and published a book, which was pr probably easier to get your hand. Oh, actually, you know what? This article, even though it's in an academic journal, you can find it online and read the whole thing. But he has a whole book called Depression, War, and Cold War that will give you a ton of stuff on this. And there are a lot of arguments you can make about, in, in particular, World War II, because that's the, the case you always get. People will say they point to World War II because, of course, it came on the heels of, or during, depending on your perspective, the Great Depression. And they'll say, if you're saying to me that war does not make us prosperous, how do you explain the fact that World War II got us out of the Great Depression? So World War II is raised as the clear, as the, as the overwhelming example. Now, you can theorize about the effects of war on society without looking at the specific example of World War II. You can understand on a gut level that blowing things up doesn't make you richer than before. Like anyone can kind of see that. And if we were to take all, if we would take the, the, the naval fleet of the U.S. and the naval fleet of Russia out into the Atlantic Ocean, and sink them, and then go home and say, oh my goodness, that was great, we're richer than ever. <laughs> you would think there's something screwy there, something screwy about that, that can't be right. Now, okay, there are some Keynesians who have a somewhat more sophisticated version of this, but not much. It's not much more sophisticated than that. And they'll say, look, look, Woods, look at the numbers. Yeah, 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 you get your whole theory, but doggone it, look at the employment numbers, look at the output numbers for the 1940s, they're amazing. And what Higgs will say, well, look, the employment numbers, well, when you siphon 11 million people out of the labor force and send them to be shot at, the labor market that remains suddenly looks pretty good. <laughs> well, duh, right? I don't need any diagram drawn for me to understand what's going on there. But then the numbers, they'll say, but look at these GDP figures. And in that article, Higgs corrects all this. I mean, you can talk about the rationing that consumers suffered, and that's important too. Consumers did not benefit from this. That, that's true. But basically what Higgs is, what he's basically saying is, if the numbers are telling you something preposterous, there's something wrong with them. The, there's got to be something screwed up about those numbers. So then he spends the article saying, what's screwed up about these numbers? Well, here's why we initially think the numbers must be screwy. Just listen to this. This is from the, the Higgs article. He says that consider that between 1940 and 1944, real GDP increased at an average annual rate of 13%. There's something screwy about that, right? He says this is a growth spurt wholly out of line with any experienced before or since. And then, moreover, that extraordinary growth took place notwithstanding the movement of some 16 million men, equivalent to 28.6% of the total labor force of 1940, into the armed forces at some time during the war, and the replacement of those prime workers, mainly by teenagers, women with little or no previous experience in the labor market, and elderly men. So what he's going to say to us is, and I'm going to read it, but I, I want to prepare for this. He's going to say, all right, so you're telling me we had the greatest spurt of growth in history at a time when we took the labor force and made it much, much, much less experienced than before. So I guess we would get the best growth of all time if we 
replaced all our workers with people who've had lobotomies. Then we would really have the best growth ever. Don't you say there's something, there must be something wrong with those numbers? So in other words, it was, here's what Higgs says. Is it plausible that an economy subject to such severe and abruptly imposed human resource constraints could generate a growth spurt far greater than any other in its entire history? And these are the numbers that people are throwing in your face. They should be embarrassed to use these numbers. You see? They should be embarrassed to use these numbers. Further, is it plausible that when the great majority of the servicemen returned to the civilian labor force, some nine million of them in the year following VJ Day, while millions of their relatively unproductive wartime replacements left the labor force, that the economy's real output would fall by 22%. So there's something wrong with those figures, too. Something's wrong with these figures. And what's wrong with these figures is that you can't have meaningful, if, if you can have meaningful national product accounting at all, you certainly can't have it without real market prices. And what Higgs will show you is exactly how we should understand the prices, such as they were, that were set during World War II, and just how much of the U.S. economy was in one way or another part of what was essentially a command economy. And so the numbers you're looking at are nonsense numbers. And when you add them all up and you get a gigantic nonsense number, you shouldn't be dancing a jig. You should be looking at these numbers critically, which is exactly what that, uh, that article does. And it's, of course, it's worth noting, uh, and I have a talk somewhere on the Mises uh, Media YouTube channel called um, Keynesian Predictions Versus American History. And the Keynesians predicted, by the way, that at the end of the war, when, when demobilization occurred and the factories stopped churning out tanks and whatever, that there would, of course, be a terrible uh, depression. There would be millions and millions, nine million unemployed. There, there were numerous people, I've quoted them, who warned that this would happen. In fact, we have one, I think it might have been Alvin Hansen even, who said, well, look, we can't just stop producing war material just like that. So in other words, <laughs> we don't need it anymore, but we got to still keep churning it out was the attitude. And they did de demobilize. And 1946 turned out to, to be the single most productive year for the private economy in the U.S. of all time. You disaggregate the numbers, you look at the private economy, that tells you the story. Because the private economy is the economy. It is, the, I mean, after all, we have to get back to first principles. What is the economy for? Like, what do we look to it for? It's for us. It's for consumers. Consumers are the key to the whole thing. And producing a whole lot of things that consumers don't use and then blowing them up does not improve our standard of living. I will say one other quick, quick thing. Sound money is destroyed by war in case after case because it places constraints on governments. And there are people who laugh at that. They say, oh, come on. What are you talking about? You're always looking for excuses to praise the gold standard. But look, if the gold standard weren't a constraint on governments, they wouldn't have all had to abandon it during World War I. So that proves that it was a constraint on them. And now that I think my phone will have just enough power, I want to shift to that one last thing I want to tell you. This is a thing from your old friend Elihu Burritt. And by the way, I hate the, 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 the autocorrect on this phone is the worst on any phone I've ever had. It, it continued to change Elihu Burritt to burrito, and that is not his name. <laughs> All right. He's a 19th century writer. I had never heard of him until I co-edited a, a book down in the bookstore. I, I'll, I'll never earn another dime from that book, by the way. It's called We Who Dared to Say No to War, where I did, I worked with a guy on the left, and we put together what we thought were the best anti-war writings for each of the major U.S. wars from 1812 to the War on Terror. And it's just a wonderful, and it's not just, war stinks, we hate war, people die. Yeah, that's good, but it's all, it's facts, and this is why the war was, was, was terrible and a lie. And, and Elihu Bird's a 19th century American writer you never heard of. And what I want to read to you is just to remind us that, of course, in the numbers, we can't capture, obviously, the true tragedy of war. And that was his point. Because what Burrett said was, you know, the human race extends a lot of sympathy to people who have been the victims of misfortunes, whether famine or shipwreck or railway accidents or whatever. And then he said, but 
and these are his words, compare the feeling with which the community hears of the loss or peril of a few human lives by these accidents, with which the news of the death or mutilation of thousands of men equally precious on the field of battle is received. How different is the valuation? How different in universal sympathy? War seems to reverse our best and boasted civilization, to carry back human society to the dark ages of barbarism, to cheapen the public appreciation of human life almost to the standard of brute beasts. And, the, and this demoralization of sentiment is not confined to the two or three nations engaged in war. It extends to the most distant and neutral nations, and they read of thousands slain or mangled in a single battle with but a little more human sensibility than they would read the loss of so many pawns by a move on a chessboard. With what deep sympathy the American nation, even to the very slaves, heard of the suffering in Ireland by the potato famine. What shiploads of corn and provisions they sent over to relieve that suffering. But how little of that benevolent sympathy and of that generous aid would they have given to the same amount of suffering inflicted by war upon the people of a foreign country. This is one of the very worst works of war. It is not only the demoralization, but almost the transformation of human nature. We can generally ascertain how many lives have been lost in war. And he's basically going to say that, that but the numbers cannot, cannot articulate this effect. The tax gatherer lets us know how much money it costs. But no registry kept on earth can tell us how much is lost to the world by this insensibility to human suffering which a war produces in the whole family circle of nations. Thank you very much. <laughs>